Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be learning about logistic regression and classification. So we're going to be talking about the logistic regression model itself, how we can give both the assumed or theoretical model and estimated model using output, some assumptions that are traditionally required for the logistic regression model and how we can assess the fit of the model, how we can interpret numerical estimates that we get from R, uh, obtain predicted values using the estimated logistic regression model, and then also how we can conduct model selection, how we can select predictors for our final model to use for predictors. So logistic regression is similar in spirit to multiple linear regression. And specifically, we're going to be talking about what's called binary logistic regression in this activity. Most people just refer to this as logistic regression, uh, but there is a slight distinction for the case in which we have two possible categories for the response variable, uh, which is what we're focusing on here. So logistic regression is a statistical method that we can use to model the relationship between the probability of a certain outcome occurring. So we're modeling a binary outcome Y and K predictor or explanatory variables is what we're using to model that probability. So we still are denoting our response variable by Y and our predictor variables by X1 through XK. Just like with multiple linear regression, the predictor variables can be quantitative or categorical, uh, but here now the response variable must be binary. So logistic regression is one of the most commonly used methods for estimating the probability of an event occurring. Okay. So just to describe a, a few examples, but there's so many across uh, lots of different areas of application. So in a medical setting, logistic regression is very useful if one wanted to describe risk, fac risk factors associated with someone, say, contracting lung cancer, right? So it's, it's useful for doctors to say, or to be knowledgeable about, well, what's the risk of this person contracting lung cancer within the next year? Okay, higher risk patients maybe need more screening, more careful monitoring. So some factors that we might think are associated with lung cancer that we could explore a bit further. Someone's smoking status, gender, age and years, their BMI, and whether or not a first degree relative has had lung cancer. Okay. These are all very likely important factors in determining someone's risk of contracting lung cancer within the next year. So we could quantify that level of risk using a logistic regression model. In a financial setting, uh, it could be that a bank wants to conduct credit risk analysis uh, so in other words, estimate the risk of a client defaulting on a loan that they're considering giving a loan to if they know the client's credit score, annual income, and employment status. There's a certain amount of risk that banks or credit unions want to take on or are willing to take on, and so they want to be able to quantify that amount of risk. In sales or marketing, uh, logistic regression could be useful for informing strategies uh, in terms of how we can quantify the likelihood of a customer purchasing a given product. We know different characteristics about that customer, like their age, gender, and purchase history. That might inform us about certain demographics or areas we should target with a marketing strategy and inform us about how to tailor, say, an advertisement or coupon campaign, something like that. For political elections, it's always of interest. Uh, many people are interested in forecasting who the winner will be uh, of political races. So very high profile example, forecasting the winner of a United States presidential race uh, for a given state, right? Forecasting this is of interest to people for a variety of reasons. And so, Often a good predictor of who's going to win is who has won that state historically. 
which party, the results of more recent political polls, and demographic characteristics about a state. Maybe the state has changed since the last election. And so we can use patterns about race, age, education levels to inform us about the likelihood of certain candidates winning presidential races or not for a given state. Okay. And some of the most popular <laughs> approaches for logistic regression or classification, uh, estimating outcomes of sports games, right? So in sports analytics, for example, in a basketball game, people are often interesting for say Vegas betting, uh, betting in Las Vegas, estimating the probability of a team winning a basketball game. Okay. So maybe we're interested in probability of the Detroit Pistons winning a basketball game. And so we can use the percent of games that they've won so far that year as a predictor, the percent of games that their opponent has won so far this year. It's likely also an important predictor. How many points the Detroit Pistons have scored on average and how many points their opponent has scored on average, et cetera. So many different predictors that would be at our disposal to predict this outcome uh, to estimate the risk or probability of the Detroit Pistons winning. Um, home court advantage is a known important categorical predictor for sports games. Okay, So all kinds of settings ranging from biostatistical applications, medical statistics, uh, to the financial sector and marketing and politics and sports. Okay, logistic regression, commonly used in all of these areas, and it's a very useful tool when you have a binary outcome you are trying to predict. So let's think about for each of these, okay, so A, B, C, D, and E. Let's think about for each of these what our response, our binary response variable is. Okay. And then we can also think about what our predictor variables are. And we'll likely have more than one predictor variable. Right. So let's set this up here. Okay. Let's get this for A, B, C, D, e, and we had E. Okay. So for example A here, we were talking about describing risk factors associated with someone contracting lung cancer within the next year. Okay. So that is our binary outcome that we're modeling here. A person contracting lung cancer within the next year or not y equals zero. Okay, so we denote the response typically with y, and we assume it's two possible outcomes, which are commonly denoted with y equals one for what is considered a success or the outcome of interest, and y equals zero for what is called a failure uh, or the, the other possible case. So note that we call this a success, but clearly in some settings, what is considered to be a quote success is not a good thing. Uh, a person contracting lung cancer, of course, is not a good thing, uh, but it's just the terminology in statistics for logistic regression. We refer to this as the event of interest occurring. Uh, that is a success. Okay. So the predictor variables in this case All of these characteristics we just described. So smoking status, that would be yes, no, and that is categorical. Gender, categorical, aging years, quantitative, body mass index, 
quantitative, right? Familial history. So whether or not a first degree relative has had lung cancer, that would be a yes, no. And that would be categorical. So we have a blend of many categorical and quantitative variables, and we can use that to help make a prediction or estimate the probability of someone contracting lung cancer within the next year. Okay, so the risk of a client defaulting on a loan is for the next example, we have that a client defaulting on a loan saying y equals one for that or not. So it's always important when setting up a logistic regression model to define what is the success and what is the failure. Okay, again, this is another example of a success, a client defaulting on a loan. It's not necessarily a good thing, but that's just what we're using as reference for uh, our logistic regression model. Okay, and then in this case, We have all these predictor variables. So the client's credit score, that would be likely quantitative. Annual income, assuming we had an actual number, not just a category, that's likely quantitative. And then employment status. You know, maybe it's employed or unemployed. Maybe we have a few categories. We could have like employed full-time, employed part-time, unemployed, but seeking a job, unemployed, not seeking a job. You know, we could have several categories. Uh, it depends on the exact data that we had collected. Okay, But these could all be these three predictors we could use, estimate the likelihood of someone defaulting on a loan. Okay. Okay, so we could say, uh, in this case, for the presidential one, the winner of the United States presidential race for a given state. Okay, so we could say, um, let's let's take for example the twenty twenty election, in which case we could say, you know, Biden. We'll just say, for example, for example, Joe Biden winning Michigan. Being Y equals one and Joe Biden not winning Michigan being Y equals zero. Okay, so note that we have to make the response variable binary to possible outcomes. In this case, we're defining it to be Joe Biden winning Michigan in 2020. Um, or it could be in a, you know, a different year, being Y equals one and Joe Biden not winning Michigan. Okay, and there's several candidates who run, right? Like we had Joe Biden, Donald Trump, um, there may have been a third party candidate. I can't remember if there was a third party candidate or not. Um, but there's other possible outcomes besides just two sometimes. But in this case, you need to make it, you need to define what you're modeling exactly in terms of a binary outcome. So here we just say it's Joe Biden winning or not. Okay. And then for the predictor variables in that case, we were saying, Okay, historical outcomes, results of political polling, and demographic characteristics. So this one was a little a little bit vague. So historical outcomes. So we could say whether or not a Democrat won the previous elections presidential race or Michigan, for example, in 
And that would be a categorical, so yes, no. Uh, the results of political polling, recent political polling. Okay, so maybe that would be quantitative. And then demographic characteristics. So we could say, for example, the percent of the state's population with at least a bachelor's degree. And that would be, for example, quantitative. The, oh, I skip one. Oh, I skipped the marketing strategies. Oops. So that was D. Uh, let's copy that down there. Okay. And then for C, which I accidentally skipped, C was the marketing strategies. Okay. So estimating the likelihood of a customer purchasing a given product. So the outcome is a customer purchasing a given product. In this case, that's a success for the company, at least. Right. So why? One or not. And then the predictor variables in this case for the marketing strategy. Customer's age, which would be quantitative, gender, which would be categorical and purchase history, which would be likely categorical, depend on the, depends on the nature of the data exactly, I suppose. Uh, we could say, for example, whether the customer has previously purchased this item or not. In which case that would be categorical, right? So if you've bought uh, Texas toast, frozen garlic toast from Meyer before, that's probably a good predictor of whether or not you'll buy it again at Meyer, right? Whether you bought that same item before. Uh, e, sports analytics, okay, the probability of team winning a basketball game. Okay, so we'll say like, for example, the Detroit Pistons winning a basketball game against the Los Angeles Lakers. And, or the Pistons losing against the Lakers. So that could be our outcome. And then in that case, we could use there'd be lots of there's lots of predictors available for sports. Uh, so percent of games. The Pistons have won would be a quantitative variable. Percent of games the Lakers have won. It would also be quantitative. Uh, how many points the Pistons have scored on average this season? Okay. Also, quantitative. We have the same thing for the Lakers. How many points the Lakers? I've scored on average this season and whether or not, whether the Pistons 
are playing on their home court or not, which would be categorical, right? He said tons and tons of predictors. We didn't even list close to all the different predictor variables that you can use to predict the outcomes of basketball games. Okay. Now, I want, I want to point out here, it, it feels like, okay, yeah, we have so much information here. We could predict the outcome of every basketball game, right? So logistic regression, we're estimating the probability of, say, the Pistons winning. And note that even if you estimate that probability extremely accurately, let's say it's 80%, that doesn't guarantee that you predict the outcome of the game correctly, because if there's an 80% chance the Pistons win, that means they could lose. In which case, if our model thought they were the likely favorite, in other words, above a 50% chance of winning, doesn't mean that we necessarily correctly pick the winner of the game. Uh, we're just estimating the probability or chance that they win. That's not exactly the same as correctly predicting who the winner is every time. That is a much more difficult and arguably um, nearly impossible task. You cannot necessarily correctly predict all binary outcomes because there's a randomness in these games. Just because the Lakers are worse or maybe the Pistons are a better team does not mean that they always win. Okay. But in the long run, we can use logistic regression to be right, hopefully more often than we're wrong in our predictions. That's the goal. Not to be perfect, but to have good, good forecasting abilities. Okay. So let's talk about the theoretical logistic regression model here, the assumed model when we use this. So there's actually two different forms of the model or what are called two different parametrizations of the model. So the most common way the logistic regression model is expressed is in what's called the logit form of the model. Okay. In this case, the right-hand side of the equation looks familiar. It's the same as in multiple linear regression. We have a linear combination of the predictor variables. Now, instead of just y on the left-hand side, though, we have the log of pi over 1 minus pi, okay. where pi is the probability that y equals 1. In other words, the probability or likelihood of a success as defined in that context, where y is our binary response variable with one indicating a success, zero being a failure. Log here is referring to the natural log function, also known as log base e. Okay, there's a few different log functions floating around out there. This is always using the log base e function here. And in general, when you see log in statistics like this, it's in statistics, if people don't specify, they're meaning the natural log logarithm, the log base e. Okay. Mathematics, they like to be more rigorous with their notation and denote that more specifically. Here, it's we're just going to assume it's log base e always. Okay. xj, just like before, is the jth predictor. And i over 1 minus pi is the odds of success. Okay, So note that, for example, Uh, if the probability of success is a 50%, then the odds of success is, oops, And the odds of success is pi over 1 minus pi, which in this case would equal 
0 0.5 divided by 0 0.5, which is equal to 1. Okay. So if the probability of success is 50%, then the odds of success is 1. Note that the odds of success for logistic regression are different than, say, Vegas odds. You may have heard the term, right, especially in like sports betting or other types of betting. What's the odds of that? Okay. There's a distinction between the everyday terminology in terms of talking about odds and when we say odds in statistics. In statistics, odds has a very particular definition. It's, it's defined as the probability over 1 minus the probability. That's the odds of something occurring. So note this distinction between everyday language and, and statistics, how we use it. The odds still has this nice property that the higher the probability of success, the greater the odds will be, and vice versa. The lower it is, the lower the odds will be. But the odds are not bounded between 0 and 1 like a probability is. The odds can be all the way down to minus infinity up to positive infinity. Okay. And that's what makes it, um, or I'm sorry, the odds can be up to a zero to positive infinity, right? So much, much wider range of values. Okay. So this logit form of the model of the logistic regression model is equivalent to modeling the probability of success. If you solved for pi here, you could manipulate this equation to solve for pi. You go through all that work, you would find that pi is equal to the exponentiation of these values. Okay, the right-hand side, which is sometimes referred to as the linear predictor. This whole quantity on the right-hand side sometimes is called the linear predictor. Okay, so we have the exponentiation of the linear predictor over one plus the exponentiation of the linear predictor. You would see that if you solved in this equation for pi. Okay. And this can be rewritten as this, where e, so it's e to the power of the linear predictor, where e is what we call the exponential function. And e is this, or exp is the exponential function. E is this irrational number, just like pi. Okay, so it's E because it's Euler's number, named after this uh, person. Uh, so again, very similar to pi, except E is about 2.718. It shows up in a lot of different mathematical contexts. Here it's just E to the power of all this stuff, over 1 plus E to the power of all this stuff, the linear predictor gives us pi for logistic regression. Okay. So a key distinction, note that pi here is just referring to the probability of success. It is not the traditional 3.1415 irrational number that we usually think of when we say pi. Okay. This is simply pi being the Greek letter P for probability here. Okay. Some people do use the letter P rather than pi in this equation, uh, but it's much less common in my experience. So we're going to go with the more common notation, which is to use the Greek letter pi for probability. So note that this is how we give a statement of the assumed or theoretical model, but we should define for a given context what is a success and what each predictor represents for a given problem, okay? So looking graphically at what this equation implies, okay, for multiple linear regression, we have that y is equal to a linear combination of the x's, so a straight line relationship. We have that straight line relationship still here, but now it's between the log odds and the linear predictor. That has a perfectly straight line, is what we're assuming when we fit the logistic regression model. 
And the log odds is a little bit of a strange quantity. It's not something we would typically talk about. Usually we talk about the probability of an event occurring. So if you want to think about it in terms of that, the probability of a success, which we're denoting with pi, looks like this. If you solve for it using the equation above again, you get this. And if you plot the probability pi by this function, okay, by the linear predictor, I should say, you end up with this S-shaped curve, which is called the sigmoid curve. Okay. And so you'll notice that the probability here it's actually bounded between zero and one using the logistic regression model. So there's what we call asymptotes, horizontal lines where this S curve will keep getting closer and closer to it as you go out to infinity. Either way, it'll keep getting closer and closer to zero, closer and closer to one, but it never quite gets there. So this is a nice property about logistic regression is that when we model the probability, our estimated probabilities will always be bounded between zero and one. So this is a benefit of a large benefit of using logistic regression rather than linear regression, because we could just use linear regression to model the Y response as being zero or one. That's, that's a quantitative form of a variable. We could just use linear regression, right? But you can get predictions outside of zero and one when you use multiple linear regression. So that would not be sensible in terms of probabilities. Okay. So this is a more sensible way to model the data. And you end up with more accurate predictions typically when doing that, Okay, when using this more complicated model. So the estimated logistic regression equation, when we get numerical estimates from, say, R, Looks very similar, but now we have hats on the pies, hats on the betas, okay, but the x's are still no hats. We're assuming the x's are constant, observed values. And then this is the logit form of the estimated model, and then we have the probability form of the estimated logistic regression model as well, where here we can get the estimated probability of an event occurring using our numerical estimates and predictor variables. So just like with multiple linear regression, we want to give the actual values of the estimated betas from the output when giving this equation. And we also, as with the theoretical model, want to define, we want to communicate clearly what we're defining as a success and what each predictor variable represents. So just like multiple linear regression, we have a set of assumptions that the model relies on here. Although not as many. So we need that the response variable y is binary, so that it has two possible outcomes, and that it's a random outcome. This can be such that we redefine the variable that we're interested in into a binary way, and that works just like the presidential election example, where there's more than two candidates, but we can just say we're modeling if Joe Biden wins a state or if he does not. And that is our two category outcome. It's possible, it's perfectly fine to redefine the problem like that. We need independent observations. So we need a random sample from our population of interest. Okay. Um, if, for example, you're modeling the, again, the um, risk of a person contracting lung cancer within the next year, for example, if we want to general, generalize our results to the whole United States, we should have a random sample of United States citizens. Um, but we shouldn't, for example, have data on three different families and just have data on each individual family member across them. Those people would be related within a family, and so that wouldn't constitute a random sample from our population of interest. So we want to make sure individuals or observations are randomly selected from the population we're interested in. And these first two assumptions that we've talked about 
pertain to the nature of the data and how the data was selected or sampled, but we don't check them with plots or graphics. The assumption that we do check with diagnostic plots is the linearity assumption. So now for logistic regression, we have an assumption of a linear relationship between the log odds and the predictor variables. And we assume that the log odds is a linear function of the predictor variables. We can check this using what are called empirical logit plots, which we'll look at for a real data set to see how that's done. Uh, and then the last thing to mention before we get to a real data set is just to give some blueprint interpretations for the slope and intercept estimates for logistic regression. Okay. So the way the math works out, which can be shown by manipulating the estimated equation or here and seeing how it changes, how the probability uh, of success or the odds of success change as a function of the betas of the x's, okay. How we interpret the betas now uh, is, for example, for a quantitative predictor, we say for every one unit increase in x, we expect the odds of a success to multiply by e to the beta, where e, again, is about 2.7 um, Odds of success are e to the beta times that. Oh, for every one unit increase in x, we expect the odds of a success to multiply by e to the beta. So the the odds multiply by a certain factor for every one unit increase in x. So now the effect is what we'd call multiplicative in what we're modeling, rather than additive, as it was for linear regression. And that's the case for everything here. Uh, for categorical predictors, we interpret it in a multiplicative way as well, which we'll demonstrate for a real data set on the Titanic. And then the intercept, we interpret as the odds of success given that all the predictors are zero. And you can see that from this equation. You take e to the power of both sides to undo the log function here. So then you would end up with just the odds equals e to all of this. If all the other x's are 0, you're just left with e to the beta not hat. Yeah. Right. So that's how we can interpret the estimated intercept here, right? And just like with multiple linear regression, you can have multicollinearity, so correlation between the predictor variables. That can result in estimated slopes not seeming sensible. You might have things that don't seem to make sense. Uh, for example, for like the basketball data, you often have a lot of predictors that are very much related to each other the win percentage for a team, how many points they scored on average each game, um, how many rebounds they got on average each game. All of those variables are very much correlated or related to each other. And so what happens is you may see, if you include all of those as predictors in a model, there would be multicollinearity. So it may look like having more points per game on average makes them worse off, like less likely to win. On the surface, it may seem like that, um, but that's just because the effects of predictors can be changed or altered when multicollinearity is present. Okay. That doesn't mean that your predictions will be bad. It's just that interpretations of these slopes are no longer valid. So let's demonstrate the usefulness of the logistic regression model by looking at a real data set. 
uh, that people love to use logistic regression for. Okay, it's a very commonly used data set in machine learning uh, and classification problems. So we're going to be looking at data on passengers from the RMS Titanic, uh, the famous British passenger liner that sank after hitting an iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean in 1912, right? Uh, so this data was uh, obtained from Stanford University, has data on nearly 900 passengers uh, from the ship. Okay. So here's an actual picture of the Titanic, huge boat. Uh, and here, here's a picture of a not real uh, setting related to the Titanic, but still interesting. Uh, we have Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie Titanic and Kate Winslet, who are playing Jack Dawson and Rose, okay, two people from the Titanic, two fictional people, and uh, the Titanic sank, right? If you haven't seen the movie, uh, spoiler, the Titanic sinks, unfortunately. And Jack and Rose are stuck in the water with Jack freezing cold here. So Jack was a third class passenger. He was lower class, not as wealthy as uh, Rose here, who was a first class passenger. And so in the movie Titanic, again, spoilers, uh, maybe don't listen if you haven't seen it yet and you want to, although it came out in the 90s. So it's been a while. Uh, Jack dies, right? So he's a third class passenger who's young and he's a male and he dies. Rose is a first class passenger who's a woman and she's young and she survives, okay? So maybe we think, okay, based on what we saw in the Titanic, Kate Winslet or Rose making it surviving, uh, we wonder if, oh, maybe, women were maybe more likely to survive in the Titanic than the men, or maybe first class passengers, the wealthy people were more likely to survive than the lower class passengers, the third class passengers. Okay. Titanic has, the movie has spurred us to wonder about this question and we have data on the actual passengers so we can explore that. Okay. So here's the data dictionary. We have the survival status of each passenger, yes or no. We're gonna model that using logistic regression. We have the sex of each passenger being male or female in this data set, uh, the passenger class. So whether they were a first, second, or third class passenger, this is going to be a categorical predictor where first class means they're the wealthiest passengers, third being the least wealthy. We have the name of the passenger, which is interesting to see, but we're not going to use that in terms of modeling. The fare that the passenger paid in US dollars, the number of siblings that that passenger had aboard uh, or spouses and the number of parents. Okay. Reading into the data set, some of these values are estimated as it was so long ago, they don't have data on everybody that's exact. Uh, but for the most part, we'll, we'll rely on it and it seems um, decently reliable, all this data here. Okay. So the idea is we're gonna use all this information or some of it at least, to model whether or not someone survived on the Titanic. Okay. So let's start with some exploratory data analysis. Um, looking at the age distribution of those who survived and did not, okay. we don't see any clear differences. There's not huge differences, right? Um, we're comparing across, it looks like those who did not survive were maybe a tiny bit older on average, but it's very close. So actually, there really doesn't seem to be much of a difference in age when we just pool everybody together in terms of survival. But sometimes that can be confounded by other factors, right? So the age of the passenger is likely related to their class whether they're first, second, or third class, right? It's probably very likely that first class passengers, the wealthiest, are older than third class passengers who are probably younger, typically. Younger people don't have as much money. 
uh, that's still true today, unfortunately. That's that's just uh, not surprising, I suppose. Okay. What about looking at um, survival status by passenger class? So whether they're first, second, or third class. Okay, so here's where we see some differences. So the frequency, the number of people, we have a little over 100 Third class passengers survived, but look how many died. It looks like close to 400. So, way more third class passengers died than survived. Note that this is flipped for the wealthiest passengers. We had more first class passengers survived than died. We also can note that there's a lot more third class passengers than the first class. Okay. But we already see some differences here. And then for second class passengers, it looks like roughly the same number of people died and survived who are second class passengers. So we certainly suspect that it looks like there's differences in the probability of survival by class, sadly. Uh, it looks like people who are not as wealthy we're much more likely to die uh, than the wealthy on the Titanic here. But we can use logistic regression to quantify that exactly and see if that holds true after accounting for other variables like age uh, and the sex of the passenger. Because as we see here, whether the passenger was male or female also looks like it has this effect on the probability of survival, right? And again, this is real data. This is this is actual data from the passengers of the Titanic. We see here that the number of males who died is very large relative to the number who survived. Guys were did not have much of a chance, right? Um, you know, this this can't tell us why that is. Maybe they stayed behind and were more likely to not take the lifeboats. Potentially. Um, or maybe they weren't as good of swimmers. We, we, we don't know for sure. The data doesn't tell us that, but but we do see males were much more likely to die than survive. Conversely, females, women, uh, and girls were much more likely to survive than die. Yeah. So we see some dramatic differences in the sex of the passengers. We also notice there's more males who were aboard the Titanic than females. Um, but we see dramatic differences in the survival likelihood by sex and by passenger class. Okay. And then if we look at the cross section of those two variables, okay, we can see that for third class passengers, okay, yeah, a huge number of third class males died compared to those who survived. Meanwhile, third-class female passengers, okay, the points are actually right on top of each other, so you can't see the purple point here. The same exact number of third-class female passengers died as survived in this data set. Okay. So based on this, it looks like a 50-50 chance for a female passenger of third class female passenger of dying or surviving, whereas males much more likely that they died just on, on the margins here. But we'll look at the, the model output to again, account for other factors like age when modeling this. So we see this trend continuing for third class passengers here. When we look at first class passengers, okay, we see that more males died than survived even for the first class passengers. Okay. But we do see that this difference is much more, uh, much smaller. Okay. The difference in survival for the males of third class is huge versus for first class, it's closer to 50 50. Okay. So the wealthy, wealthy males were much better off, is what it's looking like based on this plot than third class. Uh, and female first class passengers, okay. Here's the number who died 
it's very close to zero. So if you were a female first class passenger on the Titanic, looks like nearly all of them survived. Okay. And then second class passengers, it's somewhere in between. But for every group, we notice that males within each group, males had a higher likelihood of dying, it looks like, than females, regardless of class. Although the difference seems to vary by class. And lastly, we can look at the distribution of the age of the passengers by survival status. Okay. So here we have the total number of people who died, the total number who survived. And this is where we can see, as we saw in the box plots, okay, there didn't look like a huge difference in age based on survival. And that's holding up here too. The medians are exactly equal, the median age of those who died and those who survived. Uh, the averages look pretty equal to, okay. So we don't see huge differences here. What can we say about the difference, about the relationship between passenger class and survival status? Okay. Um, first class passengers, the wealthiest. So it's just as you might suspect going into it, the wealthiest were more likely to have survived uh, and possibly more likely to have gotten lifeboats uh, while the third class passengers, sadly, um, as they depicted in the movie Titanic, <laughs> uh, were more likely to be left behind, right? Uh, is what we suspect happened. What about the relationship between the sex of the passenger and survival status? So um, across all passenger classes, males were more likely to, uh, or we'll say females were more likely to survive than males. And it looks like much more likely. And what about the age of the passengers and their survival status? So um, we'll say marginally, it does not appear that age, that the average age differed significantly by survival status, although Here's the caveat, it will be important to look at the relationship between age and survival after, okay, after counting for the sex and class of the passengers. Okay, so maybe if you condition on, it's important to condition on the type of passenger we're looking at. Okay, so maybe when we look at all male first class passengers, maybe once we get within that group, age might be an important predictor, right? Maybe the younger male first class passengers were more likely to stay behind than the older males or vice versa. Right? You know, we don't know. Um, or conversely, maybe within the third class passengers, maybe females, who were younger were more likely to survive than older female third class passengers. Okay, that could be the case. Could be that we need the first condition within a group to see the relationship showing up. And so that's where this table can potentially be hiding that because we don't have information about the passenger class or sex of the passenger here. Same with the box plots, could be hidden based on those other variables. Okay. 
But the logistic regression model, if we throw all of these things as predictors in the model, can uncover those relationships. And so that's where it's helpful here. So let's start by fitting a model um, for predicting survival, the probability of survival, using the age and passenger class. Okay. So first, we'll start with a statement of the assumed model. Okay, so let's copy it from up here. Okay, so we're going to copy the logit form of the model. That's always what we're going to use. All right, so just like before with multiple linear regression, we'll copy and paste this. So where Y is the probability of, in this case, a passenger surviving, okay, that's what we're defining as a success. Y is this one. It's, it's important to be clear about what 0 and 1 represent for y. Um, in this case, we have two predictors, age and passenger class. Okay, You can see age is x1. Passenger class is a categorical variable with three categories, so it needs two dummy variables to represent it. Okay, so we end up with x1, x2, and x3. We have X1 is the age of the passenger in years. Okay, it's important to give the units a measurement. Um, X2 is an indicator of the passenger. Okay, so we see X2 is an indicator of the passenger being second class. Whether they're second class or not, and then if they're not, x2 is 0. And then x3 is an indicator of the passenger being a third class passenger or not. Is the odds of the passenger surviving? So here's how we can give a statement of the assumed or theoretical logistic regression model that we're using here. So it's a three predictor model. We're using age and passenger class, but there's two dummy variables for passenger class. All right. So here we get the estimated model output. We have the beta estimates in this column. Okay. So using that, we can give a statement of the estimated model. Right. So now we'll copy this because it gives a lot of the same work from the, the theoretical model. And then what we'll do is we'll just copy some terms from the estimated model here. Right. So we'll copy this part. Right. And then of the estimated estimated logistic regression model is 
this equals, and then for beta to the intercept, we'll say, we put in the number here. Okay. And then beta, beta one hat, this. So minus like that. Beta two hat is this. And then beta three hat, also negative. I gotta be careful with the negatives. Gotta be a little careful here. It is like this. Okay, so notice we have hats on the pies. Let's see, I wanna put that pi hat symbol here. There we go. Pi hat is the estimated probability of a passenger surviving. We define all these things the same, and then we also need to so make sure we have hats on all the pies, and then is the estimated odds of the passenger surviving. Okay, so this is how we can give a statement of the estimated logistic regression model. So we have our numerical estimates. Now let's look at the linearity assumption for this model by looking at some empirical logit plots. Okay. So note that you only need to do this. So I'll, I'll write this here. Note empirical logit plots only need to be examined for quantitative predictors, not categorical predictors. Okay. So by construction, the so I included an, an empirical logit plot here because it, it still informs us of some things for the categorical predictor class, passenger class. But note that we don't need to use this to check the linearity assumption. Okay. We only do this for cat for quantitative predictors. So here, let's look at the empirical logit plot or age. Okay. So in an empirical logit plot, where here we have the log odds of survival based on this survived bin, which is a binary indicator of the passenger surviving or not. Okay, So this is one for the passenger surviving, zero otherwise. Here, to visualize the empirical logits, or log odds of survival. The age of passengers, we need to create, we call them bins. So like in this case, it's about zero to 16 years old that contain multiple passengers. And then we look at the proportion of passengers in this age range who lived. And from that, we get a probability of survival in this range, and then we can use that to calculate a log odds of survival. And then we get this point. Okay. And so here we see that it looks like as age is increasing, the chances of survival goes down. Okay. We want a linear relationship here if the assumptions are met. And we can see here if we we imagine a line drawn through here. That looks reasonable. It's not perfect, but it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be linear. We don't want to see like a quadratic pattern. Um, otherwise, we might need to use a transformation of the predictor variable. 
So note that here, this seems like a fairly linear relationship, so it seems okay. Um, for age. Okay, so the empirical logit plot, the function that I created to do this, automatically bins or groups passengers and selects cut points to group them to calculate these log odds of survivals for each group. Okay. That's necessary because you can't go individual age by age when looking at the log odds, because for any single individual point, the log odds is undefined. And so we have to group them so that we have multiple passengers in each category here. Okay. There's a lot that goes on underneath the hood. The important thing is that we're looking for a straight line relationship in this plot. And here we see that's decently met. Okay. And as I mentioned, we only do this for quantitative predictors because for categorical predictors, this assumption is always met by construction. Um, we're looking at it in the form of uh, sort of like a scatter plot here, but these are categories. This is not a quantitative variable. Um, so more what the empirical logit plot tells us is just the relative difference in survival between the categories. So what we can take away from here is that first class passengers had the highest log odds of survival, which means they had the highest probability of survival. Second class passengers were somewhere in, in between, and third class passengers had the lowest chance of survival, okay? which we already knew from the data, but this makes it even more concrete. Okay. So I'll write that down. So there appears to be a fairly linear relationship in the empirical logit plot for age and survival. Indicating that the linearity assumption is met. And I'll say since passenger class is a categorical outcome. We don't check. We don't check the linearity assumption for this predictor as it is met by construction. Um, however, The empirical logit plot for passenger class shows us how That's what we can tell from that empirical logit plot. And notice the difference. So the empirical logit plot also, okay, so if we look at the beta hats, okay, notice the difference between the second and third class passenger estimates. Okay, it's about 1.2. Okay. And if you look here, Okay, the difference in height between these two points is exactly equal to the difference between the their betas. Okay. All right. All right. Now let's see, let's talk about how we can interpret these slopes in context. Okay. So let's copy our blueprint slope interpretation from before, or the categorical and quantitative predictors since we have both, All right? 
Maybe we'll copy everything down here because we're going to need it. All right. Okay. We have the intercept in the next part, so we'll we'll copy that and throw that down below the next part so we don't have to go back up for it. Okay. All right, so for the slope for a quantitative predictor, okay, so for this is, okay, interpretation for age. So for every one year increase in a passenger's age, we expect the odds of them surviving to multiply by e to the this number. So we got the estimated slope. And then we can get this number from Google like this. If you do this, e to this, okay. Google will tell you what that number is, 0 0.96. Right. So we want to say what this equals. Okay, we don't want to just, it's important, we do not want to just leave it in this form. We want to actually get the number. And Google, Google or R can help us do that. Using Google is just fine. Okay, so for every one year increase in a passenger's age, their odds of survival multiply by 0.96, holding all other predictors constant. In this case, all other predictors describe passenger class. So holding, so we'll say holding their passenger class constant. Okay. That's how we can interpret the effect of age. So essentially, their odds of survival decrease by 4% for every year older that they are. So as you get older, they were less likely to survive after controlling for passenger class. It's what we see in this data. Okay, now we can do the interpretation for uh, the second class passengers. So the expected odds of survival for, and then instead of saying the selected category, we'll say for second class passengers are, or we'll say were, the Titanic happened in the past, were e to the this number. And then we can get that number from Google again. Make sure you use your parentheses. Okay, so 0.35. So the expected odds of survival for second class passengers were 0.35 times that of, and then what was the reference category in this case? We had indicators, we had dummy variables for second and third class passengers. So that means that first class passengers were the reference category or baseline category. So the survival of second class passengers, the odds of survival were 0.3 times that of first class passengers holding, and in this case, age constant. The other predictor besides class was age. We can interpret the effect of being a third class passenger similarly. So for third class passengers, let's see what the effect was. Okay. Even bigger number, more negative. Again, not surprising.
using Google again. Oof, not looking good for the third class passengers. Okay. So the expected odds of survival for third class passengers were about 0.1 times that of, so in other words, instead of using decimals, the odds of a first class passenger, another way to phrase this interpretation, odds of a first class passenger surviving the Titanic for about 10 times. So the inverse of this, the reciprocal of this, were about 10 times that of a third class passenger of the same age. Okay, so if you hold age constant, being in the wealthiest class made you about, your, your odds of survival were 10 times that. Okay, so that's where we can see, sadly, uh, we see this effect of wealth affecting how people were treated, it looks like. Yeah. Um, okay, so then interpreting the intercept, okay, the intercept, so the expected odds of survival Okay, and instead of all, all the x's being zero, we'll say expected odds of survival of a newborn, so age equals zero years, first class passenger, okay, because if x2 and x3 are zero, that corresponds to a first class passenger. So the odds, again, odds can be between zero and positive infinity. It's about 8.17. So the risk of the probability of surviving was about eight times the probability of dying for that, for a newborn first class passenger. Is this sensible in this context? Is it extrapolation? Well, let's see. So first class passengers are in the scope of our data. What about a zero aged passenger? If we look at the summary statistics for age. We really would need a zero aged first class passenger in the data set to have it not be extrapolation. But if we look at the summary statistics, Okay, which are not broken down by class, but we can see the youngest person was 0.4 years old. Okay, so nearly a newborn, right? But technically extrapolation because zero is outside the scope of the data. But in this case, it's close enough, you know? So technically, say like technically zero years, home is outside the scope of the data, but a passenger was 0 0.42 years old, which is quite close to zero. So interpreting the estimated intercept seems or is reasonable here. It's sensible, at least, right? We don't have like someone's height being zero inches tall, something that would be impossible, right? Zero years old, we can say corresponds to a newborn. Yeah, we can do that. All right, what about the 
estimated odds of survival for a 19-year-old third-class passenger. Okay, so let's use our estimated regression equation, uh, logistic regression equation to get this probability. Okay. All right. So we're getting the odds. Okay, so here's our equation, and that tells us that if we solve for the odds, okay, we can get rid of this log function by saying e to the power of this whole side gives us the estimated odds here. And so now if we plug in for a 19-year-old third-class passenger, okay, so if they're 19, that means x1 is 19. And they're a third-class passenger, okay, so x2 is 0, x3 is 1. x2 is 0, x3 is 1. And then again, we can use, let's try to use Google for this. Let's see how it does. Might need to retype it in a special way. It might understand what we mean. Okay, yes, this, this understands what we mean. So you can also do the exponentiation function like this, exponential function. Okay, so we get 0.387 if we round for the odds. Okay. So that's the estimated odds of survival of a 19-year-old third-class passenger. Now to get the probability, this is the odds, to get the estimated probability, okay, we can Let's see, how does the odds relate to the probability? Let's use, go back up here, copy one of our equations. Okay. So the odds over one plus the odds. Okay, so the estimated probability is the odds over one plus the odds. Okay. This is the odds, right? This is e to all the e to the linear predictor. Okay. We saw that the linear predictor was this. Okay, so we can get the and substitute in here for that, here for that. Okay, and then we get the, that results. Not sure if Google can handle this, but yeah, we got to make sure we add in our parentheses. about 0 0.28. Okay. So that's what we estimate the probability of survival of a 19-year-old third-class passenger to be. It's not looking great. Okay. What about the odds of survival for a 19-year-old first-class passenger? Okay, so for a first-class passenger, Let's use this to get the odds again. For a first class passenger, we have that x1 is still 19. In this case, 19 years old. But for a first class passenger, x2 is 0, x3 is 0. 
And now if we ask Google for this value, we get 3.819. That's the odds of survival for a 19-year-old first-class passenger. And then, so if you had, if you had money again, you were first-class, you were much more likely to survive for a fixed age. And then, what is the estimated probability of survival? Okay, and so again, we can use this equation. Now we plug in the odds. The probability, estimated probability is equal to the odds over one plus the odds, okay, which in this case gives you about, about a 79%, 80% chance of survival. Okay, so you can see here the difference in survival. Even for someone of the same age, if you were third class, you had less than a 30% chance of survival. If you were first class, you had a good chance. You had 80% chance almost of survival. Okay. Still not great. I mean, there's still a lot of 20% uh, chance. Not, not, I don't think anybody would be very happy about that, but we can see the differences based on class here. Okay, so just like with multiple linear regression, we can have multiple predictors that are candidates to be included in our model. Okay, we also had the sex of the passenger here. We didn't use that yet. Um, should we have included it in our model? Uh, should we have not included the age of the passenger? Maybe it wasn't actually important. So just like with linear regression, we can use Akiki's information criterion and the Bayesian information criterion, AIC and BIC, to help us decide which predictors to keep. And so in general, a model with lower AIC and BIC values is considered better. It will be expected to have better predictive performance out of sample for data that the model has not yet seen. Okay. So for example, here, another logistic model was fit, this time using the sex and age and passenger class of the passengers. Should we have done this though? Is sex an important predictor to include in the model here? Okay, so we have the AIC and BIC for this larger model, this model with more predictors. And then we have the AIC and BIC values from before. So these are larger, which is not good for the smaller model. That means AIC and BIC favor the larger model here. So since the model without the sex of the passenger is a predictor, add larger AIC and BIC values. So this was bigger than this, and this was bigger than this. We should, this implies that we should include sex as a predictor in our Okay. All right, so one last prediction. So Jack Dawson, played by Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic movie, was a 20-year-old male who was a third-class passenger. Okay, He was the low-income, uh, in the low-income group. Rose DeWitt, who cater, was played by Kate Winslet. She was the upper class. She was the very wealthy 
first class passenger and she was only 17. Let's get the estimated probability of survival for each of them. Okay. So to do that, you can use this equation. Okay. And then we're gonna use the model now that has um, the sex of the passenger as, as a predictor as well. So we have So let's fill in our estimates for beta not hat. Fill in our estimates for beta one hat. And it's negative here, so we handle that like this. I think I messed up some of the equations here. Oh, we'll just update the top one maybe and then we'll paste it over the bottom here. Okay, so we have the estimated intercept, we have estimated beta hat one, beta hat two is the effect of age. So beta hat one was for the effect of being male, and we had age. So male minus 2.59. Age was minus 0.03. Yep, being second class. Minus 1.2. Then we have x4 is minus 2.46. Okay. Okay, there we go. So we have 3.63 minus 2.59 minus 0.03 minus point minus 1.2 minus okay great and then this is the estimated odds of success odds of survival we can paste it down here okay there we go kind of a little tedious um. So we end up with this equation, okay, and then let's fill in the estimate or the values for, okay, so we'll start with Jack. So for Jack, okay, he was a 20 year old male, okay? So the first predictor is for being male, okay, so X1, okay, so that is, Okay, so we have yeah, times one. And okay, so that's the indicator of him being male. So we have, all right, what's X2? So X2 is the age. Okay, so he's, Jack is 20 years old. So X2 is age, so we'll say times 20. X3 is an indicator of being, so we have one, two, three. X3 is an indicator of being second class, which he was not, he was third class. So this is times zero. And then X4 is an indicator of being third class, which he was. So times 
one. Okay. And we filled it that in so we can copy what we did for the top, for the bottom. Okay. All right. And then here's what we'll do. We'll get this value using Google first. So that's Jack's odds of survival. So we end up with that number over one plus that number. So good to show your work. Um, and then, okay. So there's a lot of rounding potentially on steps along the way. So that's why it's good to show your work just to make sure it's clear what was done. So there's the probability of survival for Jack. 12% is all. And what about for Rose? So for Rose, let's start with a fresh equation again. Okay, so Rose, X was, was an indicator of being male, so We'll say times zero because she was female. Her age, X2 is the age. Um, so in this case, she was 17. X3 is an indicator of being second class. She was first class, so it's times zero. X4 is an indicator of being third class. She was first class, so it's times zero. Okay. And then we can get this value for rows. So for rows, her odds of survival were this. So I'll make sure show our work completely. We can update the bottom, the numerator, or the denominator. Okay. And then we get this value. And thank you, Google. Okay. So it's about, about 0 0.96. Okay. So we see for Rose, the estimated probability of survival, given what we knew about her, was about 96%. So she she was looking good. She was she was sitting comfortable on that door floating in the water. Um Jack. Seems like the movie was accurate. So Jack did not make it in the movie. He died. Here we estimated he had about a 12% chance of making it. Seems like our model is consistent with what the movie showed in, in Jack dying and Rose surviving. Okay. Um, so that's how we can get estimated probabilities from the logistic regression model. Okay, so the R code for completing everything we did here in this activity is included at the bottom. Okay, and that's it for logistic regression. So uh, that's how we can conduct classification, essentially predicting. In, in our example, we did predicting whether or not someone would survive or not on the Titanic using logistic regression.